everyone, welcome. We have Hanifa Naya Washington here with us today. Hi, Hanifa. Hey, Beth. So happy to be here. Thank you so much for being here, especially as you're uh, getting ready to move across the country. I really appreciate your time and I can't wait to get into it. So I'm going to tell people a little bit about you if they haven't heard about you. So Hanifa Naya Washington, she, her, hers, is an award-winning cultural producer and healing justice practitioner with 20 years in nonprofit leadership. As a co-founder and the chief strategy officer for Fireside Project, Hanifa supports the design, facilitation, and communication of Fireside Project's mission, vision, strategic initiatives, and future goals. Hanifa is a master facilitator, Reiki practitioner, and community organizer who has dedicated her life to creating organizations, gatherings, spaces, and experiences rooted in the values of beloved community. Hanifa Neo is also the co-founder and organizing principal of One Village Healing, an online BIPOC-centered healing, resilience, and psychedelic wellness space, and is in her fourth year as lead facilitator of the New Haven Community Leadership Program, whose mission is to equip, support, and inspire the practice of value-based Values-based collaborative, collaborative leadership. Thank you so much for being with us, Hanifa. It was, uh, you know, you're a busy woman, and I'm so excited that you're here. So the first question I always love to ask my guests is, how did you um, build your career? You know, you you have your hands on a lot of projects. You're a leader, a community organizer. You know, now with the Fireside Project, I'm curious. What was your path? I also did notice on your website that you have a really interesting degree that you, you know, you studied. Um, what is it like Russian and Soviet studies? Yeah, um. <laughs> so I, I studied um, communications and Russian and Soviet studies was my was my minor, which wow. was very interesting. So <laughs> I've had <laughs> I've lived a very interesting life so far, I think. Um, and I I've had different paths sort of laid out for me when I was younger. I thought that I was going to be a, like a, di a diplomat. And so I was sort of gearing up to, um, you know, work for the State Department. And so I went to college with that in mind. And um, after I graduated, I uh, applied to the Peace Corps because that's kind of a step in. Um, and I wanted to go to Russia or Ukraine, actually, because um, I studied Russian all through high school and then all through college. So um, I figured that, you know, understanding the lang the Russian language and culture would be important in my lifetime um, and that it would definitely afford me to be able to be a diplomat. Um, and so I applied to Peace Corps. I got accepted to Peace Corps and they wanted to send me to China. And I was like, though that is close to Russia, it is not quite Russia. Um, and so I deferred. And that was this interesting point when my life actually just took this really interesting turn. Um, and so I had, I thought for sure I was going to just get what I wanted and be, just go. And so I had planned, you know, when you apply for the Peace Corps, like you, you have to get all of this like medical work done and all this stuff and I'd be ready to leave. And I was ready to leave. Uh, and I didn't have uh, an intention <laughs> on staying. And so I, there I was, like, staying with my parents, like, not wanting to do that. And had a year, because I deferred for a year, hoping that I'd be reassigned. And so I reached out to a few friends. Um, and I ended up coming to the East Coast. So I was in Texas. That's where my parents live. Um, and I ended up coming to the East Coast and worked at this place called Nature's Classroom. Um, which is like this outdoor environmental education program working with young kids. But it was great because your housing is covered, your food is covered, you live in community with great people, you're outside of nature, which I love. And so I was like, this was a great way to defer for a year. And so um, uh, well, the year came and went, and then I got my second assignment, and they wanted to send me to Uzbekistan. And I was like, that's closer, but still not quite Russia. So then I just said, you know what? I'm not going to do this. And so I ended up staying in Connecticut, working for Nature's Classroom, and really kind of like diving into, um, yeah, youth development work and nonprofit work, and really loved that. And so I really got my start working with nonprofits, not because I planned that um, in this way, but I saw the potential of when you, particularly with young people, make space for them to grow. 
um, and develop um, and to become leaders. Like it's a really wonderful feeling um, and has such a great impact. So I ended up, yeah, staying on the East Coast, doing a lot of work with youth and helping to develop um, youth development nonprofits. Um, and then I um, really began to uh, want to do more in the realm of nonprofit work. Um, really saw the need for healing spaces and community spaces for people to be able to have like the conversations that matter. Um, and so for me, I've always been um, uh, sort of motivated by community. Like growing up um, in a small black church in Detroit um, was everything. You know, my entire family went to that church and it was it was the feeling of, you know, you're supported, there's a place for you, you're always going to have your, your needs met, um, and there's there's nothing like belonging, right? right? And so, how do, like, so this question for me has always been like, how do we create spaces of belonging? Um, how, do, how do we create them so that all people feel like they can come to a place or be in a conversation or also like be held as they go out into out into their work or into their lives um, and have places to return to. And so um, that, that spirit of community, the spirit of church, the spirit of belonging has always been a great motivator for, for me. And I'm, you know, I, I kind of just chuckle sometimes and I just say, well, thank you spirit for not, for not being sending me to Russia, you know? And, uh, and now I have this language like in my brain that I rarely ever use, but it's there and it's maybe one day it'll come in handy. But I, I think that I also, like I, I listen to, you know, Beth, I listen to spirit, if you want to call it that. Um, I, 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 I ask and I listen and I follow. And so sometimes that takes me down really interesting paths. <laughs> Um, um, and, or into different communities or into different opportunities. Um, but I've always aligned myself with this idea of belonging and creating spaces of belonging and healing. So anything that I do must be aligned with that and also be something that's moving humanity toward greater liberation um, because to me that's what it's about. Um, so what can I do every day? Uh, what what can, I, can I be inspiring every day? to move humanity toward greater liberation. Um, and often it just starts with like you, you're myself, right? Um, it starts with the people around, it starts with local, it starts with building bridges. And I think for a long time in my work, I was like, okay, let me serve everybody. Let me get everybody set. Let me make sure everybody has stuff that they need. And what I realized was like, I was hurting and lacking and not full. And so really about 10 or 10, 12 years ago started and was really lucky to meet up with some powerful spiritual communities um, and medicine communities. And so I started doing ceremonial work, um, particularly with ayahuasca and psilocybin. And it really just changed my life. It changed um, my ability to hold space for myself <laughs> um, and to create space for myself and to be in deep reflection and just this process of like letting go and discovering um, and growing my awareness of where the pain points were, which helps me under, you know, understand more about um, how to apply different medicines to those pain points. Those medicines is not just plant-based medicines, but you know, having the difficult conversations I needed to have, coming to uh, to, with grips with some some of the ways that the world just is and how it impacts me, um, what I'm eating, how what, what I'm consuming, um, the music I'm listening to, the shows I'm watching. So all of that's medicine, right? Um, and then integrating what I'm learning um, into my practice of living. And so I am really thankful to having a, a medicine community, a spiritual community, um, and... Um, that uh, pr those practices and, and um, the gift of that, again, also just really inspired me. And so I think once I became in a place where I could honestly reflect to people the impact of psychedelic community and integration, um, you know, just immediately had an impact on others and people wanted to know more and they're curious. And particularly people who are coming from, you know, spaces and communities 
you know, that, um, you know, might not have access to this, the knowledge or the, just the information of like where to begin and how to start and what is it. And, um, so I, I, I think just also sort of just followed suit with what I've always done. It's just like, okay, how do I create some other spaces for people to belong and feel like they have access um, and care when it comes to psychedelic wellness, um, psychedelic um, community. And um, One Village Healing, right, which we started in 2019, um, really was created because we didn't have it. Like, there were several of us like, wanting to have a space that was BIPOC-centered where the facilitators were people of color, um, where when you look around, there's other people of color. When we're moving into like mindfulness spaces and meditation spaces and yoga spaces and Reiki spaces, um, it just was not something that was around, you know, where, where we live. And so, um, and in the sort of second half of, of the beginning year, began to incorporate basically just like information sessions around like, well, what is psychedelic wellness and what is this? And, um, and it was awesome. You know, people came and are interested and are learning and growing, um, and, um, discovery, like if it's for them or not. Right. So, um, but I feel like I also, there was this year that one of my teachers gave me a book called the year of yes. Um, and it was really inspiring. And so in 2019, I had read that book <clears throat> and I started just saying yes to things. I started saying yes to invitations and um, uh, yes to things that like, also spirit was telling me to do, but I was sort of ignoring. And so I was like, okay, this is the year. I'm gonna just start saying yes. I'm gonna do all the things. And one of those invitations was to go to Burning Man. And for years, I had been being asked by a couple of my friends, um, Hey, do you want to go with us? We're going. I'm like, no, <laughs> like, that is not for me. Like, that sounds really intense. Um, and the invitation came in early 2019 when the tickets, I guess, went on sale or whatever. And I said no. <laughs> but then months later, after I had read this book, like really, like June or July, I said, okay, let's do it. Let's go. And so. People spend like a year planning to go to Burning Man. That's me. <laughs> so there we were like a, like a month and a half out maybe. And so, but the magic happened, right? I magically found this amazing ticket. Um, and uh, that's like the hardest part. And then we had friends who knew someone who had a little bit of space in their camp. And so we had a camp. And so, yeah, we, we got our little plane tickets and flew across the country uh, and got a, you know, packed all our stuff up in a little van and uh, drove into the desert. And we arrived really l late or like early mm -hmm. in the morning. It was like mm -hmm. three in the morning. Um, and uh, so it's like dark. Um, I don't, I can't really tell. Like, I have no orientation of like what's happening. But I have to pee because we've been in the car forever. And so we kind of just parked the car before we even found our camp. And um, there's just this fine mist of the dust floating in the air. And um, you just immediately like put my mask on and was sort of like squinting, like looking around. And the bathrooms are kind of in these clusters at Burning Man and these, like, there's these flashing blue lights. So you know mm -hmm. where to go. Like the little beacon, like the little pee pee beacon. beacon. <laughs> and so anyway, so I get out of the car and I go to find these porta potties with my friend, and I open the porta potty, and the smell was just outrageous. And I was like, "What am I doing? Like, why did I say yes to this? <laughs> this is going to be crazy." But anyway, the week ended up being really amazing. I'm, I'm, it's 2022. I'm still integrating the experience. Like, it was one of the best things that I've ever done, and one of the worst things that I've ever done. Like, wrapped into one. <laughs> One adventure, <laughs> but what was magical also about that was that uh, at Burning Man is where Josh uh, White and I actually met. Um, so Josh is the founder of Fireside um, Project, and if I had not said yes to like going to this, like we would have never met. We would have never put our hearts together to create what became Fireside Project. So 
there was a lot that came out of that year of yes. Um, and it's been an adventure, uh, really just jumping in. So we got together uh, kind of a year later um, around this concept of Fireside. So in the summer of 2020, um, and it's just really taken off. Uh, so in April, the line launched. Last year, April 2021, we're coming up into our one-year anniversary pretty soon. So, um, And it's been really powerful because I feel like all of the learning that I've done in my life and my life experiences from nonprofit development and um, creating spaces of healing and understanding what it means to organize people and also being an artist and a musician and a creative designer, I'm able to take all of that and really pour it into, you know, what is, what fire, into Fireside Project. And it's like a true gift and it just is growing and growing and growing. And I'm just, I couldn't love be proud it. Of it. I, that's crazy because it feels like it's been around so much longer, but I guess the years have been going very yeah. slow. Um, I love your Burning Man story. That's actually, <laughs> that's how I ended up there. And back in 2013, I said no for many years. And then it was kind of like I was on this, you know, surrender experiment, essentially. I was like, you know what? Why have I been avoiding this for so long? And then, of course, completely changed my life. And I've been back <laughs> four times since. But um, you said so many gems that I want to get into uh, deeper with you around community, connection. You know, this, this is something that everybody's talking about, you know, especially since 2020 is this lack of lack of connection and everybody mm. feeling very isolated and not mm -hmm. really having community while we all know, I think in our hearts and our souls that this is the answer to our, a lot of our societal problems is connection. Um, and we're so disconnected, but let's hear mm. a little bit more about fireside project for those that don't know what it is. Um, cause it is fascinating. It's like, you know, when it first came out, I was like, wow, this is incredible. You know, like, why hasn't this been done before, you know, to have this support? But let's <laughs> let's hear a little bit about it and what it is so that people know a little bit more about how to work with it and use it if they need it. Um, and then Ooh. also, like, is it a nonprofit and how is it, you know, funded? I'm curious. Sure. Yeah. So Fireside Project is um, we are a fiscally sponsored project at this point. Um, so we officially sponsored by an awesome organization, a nonprofit called Social Good Fund. And their whole deal is being able to support and um, incubate uh, awesome projects and ideas that need the, the fiscal support, as well as like the training and coaching as they launch to become their own nonprofit. Um, so we have intentions of, uh, yeah, incorporating in applying for our 501 this year, which is pretty exciting. Our sort of grand vision is to be able to create uh, a safe, um, diverse, and equitable, uh, beloved psychedelic community. And that looks like providing culturally attuned care. Um, it looks like uh, offering educational um, opportunities, public educational opportunities, as well as um, uh, really understanding what we're learning through through research and also sharing that as as we go and all of this is done under um or through the lens of, of equity and through a lens of moving toward the greater liberation for all and so the the kind of heart of what we're up to though it's not the only thing but it is the heart of what our side project is uh offering in this space is the psychedelic peer support line and the Psychedelic Career Support Line is a free service. It's a national service, so it's available all across the United States. Um, it is uh, open from 3 p.m. to 3 a.m. Pacific time. And we offer psychedelic peer support uh, for folks who are actively in an experience or processing or integrating any past psychedelic experience. Um, so this is um, something that is uh, for folks who are actively tripping. This is for folks who are trip sitting. This is for facilitators, right, in the space. This is for um, someone who just might have questions and needs some information. Um, this is for, um, you know, uh, again, any time after you've had a psychedelic experience, right? Because integrating or processing these things isn't linear, right? So something in, could have happened 20 years ago that you're still needing support integrating or, or memory pops up. So 
Um, we really believe that no one should be alone, particularly when they're in an experience and they need support or grounding um, or they're fearful or having uh, some challenging moments or just want to be tethered. You know, um, we really think it is our responsibility, you know, um, to provide that at the very least. Um, and um, we also know that everybody can't afford all the time uh, an integration, a psychedelic integration coach and have that sort of aftercare and understand deeply that for us, that's actually where the work and a lot of the transformation and potential can come in is during the integration process. So at least having, you know, emotional peer support, um, during and, and after these experiences seems uh, fundamental. Um, and so we can, you can say that we al are also, you know, in a risk reduction organization. So um, just being able to let someone knows that during an experience there is somebody there who they can speak to and support them um, in, in itself is risk, a risk reduction. Um, we're actually also working with... Um, the University of San Francisco, of California, uh, San Francisco, with Dr. Joe Zamaria, um, to uh, do what we're doing a study to, to show are we an effective risk reduction tool. So after every call and text, um, we send um, a post call survey, and people can fill it out, or they, they, they don't have to. Um, but just asking, like, what you know, what was your experience? Were you de-escalated? Um, would you have called the police or gone to the ER? Um, did you feel seen and held? And so what we're finding is that people are, we are diverting people from calling 911 or emergency services if it was not needed. So we're, 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 we're you know, we are in essence, right, you know, helping save money for a lot of different states, um, as well as like saving, like saving lives, as well as uh, diverting people from potential traumatic experiences um, uh, in terms of interfacing with emergency services when you might be in a, in a deep altered mind state. Um, and we have, we just reached a 2000 caller mark, which is super exciting. Um, and um, we uh, are possible because of the volunteers who said yes to this. So our volunteers sign up for a year of service on the line. So they work the same shift every week for four hours, um, and they go through a four-day training, um, and we have ongoing training that they also they also do. And so um, it's been really amazing um, to uh, meet so many people. We have trained about 70 people so far, uh, and we're just bringing on another round of volunteers. They're coming on this, this week, actually, and then, um, we also have a pretty powerful initiative coming up um, that's going to also increase our um, volunteers. We're bringing on a, an additional 40 volunteers. And so this cohort is what we're calling the Affinity Cohort. And so in line with our mission in terms of creating an equitable, safe, beloved psychedelic community, um, we understand that representation matters in terms of um, what populations and what people are using the line, know about the line, are volunteering on the line. Um, and um, the psychedelic space in, um, in, you know, in the United States now and folks who are above ground, you know, is greatly homogenous um, for many reasons. And so we believe that um, all people should have access to this sort of care um, and have access to the 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 benefits of, of psychedelics as well as being able to, you know, have established careers um, and uh, spaces of leadership with, within the psychedelic fields. And so how do you get there from, from where we are now? Um, and from where we are now is greatly because of the impact of the war on drugs and just because of, and the greater systems of oppression that are at play in the United States. And so we just believe in creating these pathways in. So our volunteers who are... Um, coming into this affinity program are going to be on call during their shifts to support integration calls for individuals who come from their affinity group. And affinity, basically, we're using that word in terms of sameness, likeness, when it comes to racial affinity. So we are this first year focusing on the BIPOC communities, as well as military veterans and transgender communities or transgender people. Um, and so starting in June, um, folks will be able to call the line 
and say, I'm having, I want to integrate, I'd like to speak with a military veteran to integrate with, or I want to speak to um, someone who's black or someone who's Latina or someone who's Southeast Asian or somebody who's trans or someone who's, um, you know, so, uh, and it's, it's not the answer. And we also understand that nobody exists within um, a monolith identity. Um, we all are at intersections of identity, but this is one step forward um, as we continue and, and we'll deepen this initiative as we go. Um, and so we, we really believe that it is important, and this, this is a phrase I've learned from one of my teachers, Naomi Span. you know, that who we say we be is like what we actually do in the world. Because a lot of people can say equity and say diversity and say transformation, and but not like do it. So we're, we're actively doing this. Um, and the sort of other part of this uh, affinity program and our equity initiative is then um, creating the pathways into the psychedelic field. So we are um, building an equity fund. So any of our affinity volunteers after they finish their year of service can apply for direct grants to support their education, their work. Um, and that could be in developing their own business and paying for fees for licensure, as well as any sort of training or program they want to go to. Um, and then we're also directly working with um, our equity fund collaborators and partners. So Naropa University was the first, and they're amazing, um, offering every year at least one, um, but maybe two full scholarships to their um uh, psychedelic facilitators training that, that they're just they just actually launched this year. Um, MAPS has come MAPS PBC is offering five slots to their MDMA um, facilitators training. Um, Fluence is offering access to their several of their courses as well as psychedelic psychedelic dot support. Um, and there are others coming uh, and we're also working with some amazing clinicians and researchers to offer internships for our affinity volunteers, including uh, Dr. Monica T. Williams, Dr. Robin Carhart Harris, Dr. Christopher, um, are offering slots for internships for folks. So we understand that it's not just money that people people need. Um, they need they need support and they need network, right? And so we are building that um, and mm -hmm. will follow and track and support our affinity volunteers, our affinity cohort members as they like move through these pathways and, you know, and create opportunities for continued, re you know, networking as well as, you know, checking in with them every so often and be like, how's it going? You know, what, what have you been up to? Um, what, what else, how else can we support? Um, so we see this as a growing community. So, so once you're in Fireside Project, you're in for life. <laughs> this is incredible. I had no idea it had all these, th this, these arms to it. I thought it was just the support, you know, like the online support. And I mean, even then I, I'm sitting here shaking my head. I'm like, God, if I only had that like 10 years ago, cause I remember, um, you know, I've been working with psychedelics since I was young, you know, since I was mm -hmm. a pretty young teenager. But when I got really deep into the medicine work, you know, like the ceremonial intentional use of it, mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, it was a long time ago where there wasn't there wasn't support and people didn't understand. And my therapist had never even heard of it. And it was very it was very hard, actually. It was very hard to integrate. And I didn't even, you know, the word integrate wasn't even talked about back then. Right. Um, so right. this is incredible. And I was going to ask about uh, how the training works. Are these, are, are most of the volunteers, um, you know, just regular people who have a background where they've worked with medicines, but then they get trained? Or are these people who've already gone through, you know, are they therapists? Like, do they have to be licensed? Because, of course, I'm sitting here going, I know so many people would be interested in this. Um, yeah, but yeah, like, is there a requirement awesome. for the volunteers? Yeah, so our volunteers come from all, you know, walks of life and backgrounds. And so what's awesome about what we're up to, Beth, is like, this is a movement. We're part of it. This is peer support, right? Mm -hmm. We are people to people. So people who have had their own experiences with transformational mind states, um, their own experiences with integration, their own experiences um, with you know, being in, you know, challenging situations, euphoric situations, um, who have said, yes, like, I want to support, I want to give 200 hours of my life this year to ensure that, like, nobody's alone um, and and that uh, that people have this free service and access. 
So they come, our volunteers come from all, all over. And so we uh, don't require a uh, sort of, uh, we don't require um, folks to have certain training or um, to, to have be in a certain profession um, because psychedelic peers are, come from all over, you know, they have uh, many different ways that people have come into it or understand it or win in their life. And so we actually have this sort of in, inside, you know, saying that we do during our training, which is like, you know, hang your credentials at the door um, because you're coming in here as a peer. And so when you're on the line, you're a peer. You're, you're not a doctor. You're not a nurse. You are, um, you know, you're, you're not a psychotherapist. You're a, you're a peer. And so we really, our training is four days and um, so so interesting. We just finished we just finished one of our trainings this past weekend, um, and you know we send a feedback uh, survey afterwards. And you know there's at least there's always a handful of people which I totally get who are just like this is it's too long. Can we is there any way to make it shorter? And we tried. There was one time we did like a two day training, and it just really you really need that time to sink into the practices because they are uh, a little. Uh, counterintuitive. Um, so on the line, we really practice reflective listening. Um, uh, we, we, we practice like holding space, uh, which actually kind of requires a bit of like silence. And so it's not about like filling up the space with like your internal questions and not wanting there to be silence on the line or in, in the communication. Um, we really practice about like, what does it mean to remove your ego so they can really be with people um, and not having like power dynamics of like powering over or guiding people into something. We're really there to be with uh, the the person calling in or texting in and to not have an agenda when we're with them. And so there are all these like uh, practices that we do and then um, demos and then people go and like they practice, they, they have a lot of practice space. So people are paired up or they're in triads, like practicing these skills. Um, and so, uh, of course, we have a whole part uh, on ethics. Uh, we talk about, you know, the mechanics of like how the line actually technically works. Um, we talk about um, our safety protocols and, um, um, you know, our emergency and safety protocols, which is pretty important. And we give a lot of room for discussion as well and for people to ask questions. Um, we also have a whole section on what I call culture of belonging, which is about that inner work piece. So um, understanding how there are systems of oppression um, at play in the world and how, how does that impact you? How does that create biases and blind spots um, and uh, to be in community around that sort of discovery and reflecting. And it's just important. We actually offer the culture belonging um, training sessions about three to four times a year because there's, there's different topics that we cover. Um, but there's sort of an introduction piece that we do during the training. Um, and, and there's just a lot of time for people to, to be getting to know each other because you come in to your training and you see the 20 or 30 people you're with in your training and then you're just kind of plugged into once you get on the line into your shift you know and you work the same shift every week and so then it's just those like four or five people that you kind of connect with um so it's a it's a cool it's a cool training it's a, a very in intensive and um we have found it to be um gearing up for it is always just like a lot because it's four days of prep and you know, these are full days that we do, so they're they're eight hour days, um, and just always feel so enlightened. Um, not in like I'm a Buddha, but enlightened and like filled with light. You know, in my heart uh, afterwards, because it's just like wow, these people are saying yes, and they're all so different. You know, it's just each sort of cohort of volunteers are just different, and just seeing the people. We 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 accept volunteers from all over the uh, world. So we have people from, you know, different countries showing up in different time zones. And so, yeah, it's, um, it's pretty awesome. Ah, this is so beautiful. And, um, you know, I love the principles of, of the actual, um, you know, support. This is, it sounds very similar to when I, I did some Zendo training actually at Burning Man. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. It's, it's so, you know, it's, it's so different than we would think what it would be, but it is actually what people need is just to have someone there, you know, to hold that space, to listen, 
you know, and not come in and, you know, try to influence or take over or have that, that power struggle or, um, you know, to allow the, the experience to unfold, whether it's integration or during the actual um, experience, especially if, you know, people are, and we all know there's people out there doing pretty high level work by themselves. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, and I, I do, I'm curious um, to ask you about this because this has come up in literally almost every podcast interview I've done is, um, you know, psychedelic assisted therapy is growing so much and it's probably going to grow very fast, I assume. Um, it seems to be, but it's very inaccessible to a lot of people, you know, it's, and it's also inaccessible in, in, you know, many places where people live. So there is this underground reality of people holding space for each other or small ceremonies or one-on-one -on -one work, um, you know, underground therapists. And I do, I personally don't believe it's going to end just by having more psychedelic assisted therapy available because it's still going to be inaccessible, you know, on some level. Um, you know, what do you think the future holds for, you know, how fast this psychedelic space is growing? There's also now more and more of these um, kind of online psychedelic music apps popping up or, you know, online psychedelic experiences. Um, you know, I'm curious, like what your view is on where this is all going and how it's all going to fit together with not only what you guys offer at Fireside, but just in general in this space where the demand is high, you know, we're in a mental health crisis in, in this country, at least, or I, I believe like pretty much everywhere. And the supply is very low, like the legal, you know, the legal supply, it's low and, and very inaccessible to most people. Um, but yeah, what do you feel like the future is for, for the direction of this? And it, are, and are we going in the right direction, do you think? <laughs> mm, that's a really good question. It's a big one. I think that there's just a couple, um, several sort of possibilities and patterns at play and ha happening. Um, the underground, um, I feel is like always going to be there and, and it's only going to get, I think, deeper and wider. And so I think more people will be like joining the underground, um, as facilitators and leaders and seekers. Um, and, um, I think that what's happening above ground, uh, in terms of clinics, you know, right now it's ketamine, and then once things are legalized, you know, soon the, there will be MDMA, there, there will be, um, you know, psilocybin uh, clinics um, and therapies available for folks. And I think that um, there's a lot of possibility to get it right in terms of, uh, for, particularly from our purview from, at Fireside, which is about ensuring that nobody's alone, right? And that p people know that they have a resource. Um, they're sort of like the safety net. So recently we had a, a caller who was like, uh, her and her partner had done MDMA. They work with a guide uh, and they have a psychedelic or a, psycho, uh, a psychedelic therapist, but that person was not available to support them at this time and they really needed help. So they called the line. And so for us, we are just like, yeah, we are, you know, equal opportunity, you know, um, supporters. And so we will help whoever from wherever, whether it's a clinical situation or you're at an ayahuasca ceremony in the, in the, you know, jungle of which we've had people call. So for us, we just are like, we just want as many people to know that we're here. Um, and I think that we will see, um, we're going to see more people, I think, accessing psychedelics who, for the first time, outside of the clinical space, who are not going to know what to do or will feel overwhelmed or um, who won't understand the arc of an experience. Um, and... I think that more and more people are going to be in that boat um, of coming into use for the first time and then not, not being overwhelmed and not mm -hmm. knowing what to do. And so for us, that's like why we want as many people to know that we exist, that we're here for the first timers. So we're also here for 
you know, the old timers who, you know, um, have an experience that feels a little bit too much or they just need someone to talk to after an experience. Um, we also want to support the facilitators, which is, I think we will see more uh, as there are more and more clinics and more and more underground stuff pop, popping up. I think the facilitators are going to need um, and, and should have also space to debrief and um, integrate uh, um, and to be held as they sort of uh, unwind um, from some challenging sessions or just long days or anything that's coming through to them. And so, yeah, I I've all I've, I I don't think the underground is going anywhere, right? And just I again to say I think it's going to get wider and deeper. Um, and actually, like, more underground. I think there's just going to be less communication about what's happening on the underground and, like, not a desire to bridge um, at all. So I think that, um, and I honestly, like, personally, I think it's, like, kind of important for that to happen. I think that because just for protections and to ensure, particularly for some medicines, that that they stay safe and that they stay guarded um it requires having mm -hmm. an underground um so i i think that you know there's all types of just wild things that i'm hearing about and reading about in terms of pharmaceuticals you know coming to you know save the day and like taking the tripping out of out of psilocybin and just like what what is that like where are we really going and what is the real point um, and I know that there are people who, um, like really enjoy just recreational use of psychedelics, which is wonderful. There are people who really re are leaning on it for, you know, medical reasons and for treating, you know, PTSD, for example. Um, there are people who are just sort of curious. And, um, I think that within all of it, why something like Fireside hasn't existed already, um, uh, just like it just feels, it really blows my mind for, for one. And that like, I'm like, we need like, we need, you know, thousands of volunteers based on like what the, what the psychedelic, projected mm -hmm. psychedelic use is, is going to be in the United States. Right. So, um, I only see the need for fireside and the services that we mm -hmm. offer growing, you know, exponentially in, into the next, you know, five and 10 years. I agree. And I, I love this perspective so much. And I'm so glad you guys are doing this. I just I keep looking back on my own experience as someone who would be considered pretty well versed. You know, that's that's what blew me away is my first experience with ayahuasca. I was like, oh, I've done all these things for the last, you know, 20 years or whatever. And Ooh. I mean, I this is how bad it got. I literally turned to a DJ who I've never met in my entire life, who I followed on Facebook. And he was the only person I knew they could talk to me about this level of the experience I had. Um, thankfully, there's there's been a community built since then. And now I have, you know, kind of the medicine community. But let's talk a little bit more about this because this has come up pretty much in every conversation I've had the last few years, um, even pre-pandemic. And of course, since then, it's gotten to be a big topic. But this idea of community and connection mm. and it's it's a strange world because we all we all you know it feels like we all want it we seek it and we're missing it yet we are more connected than ever in the history of humanity you know via the internet and all our devices um but we feel so disconnected and every conversation i've had with you know conscious communities that i'm involved in and it's funny because we're in community and we're all sitting there saying I see, I'm seeking my community and, you know, people are trying to move all over the place. People are exploring different parts of the world or the country to live in because they seek community. What do you, I'm curious, like, I, cause I've wondered this even within my own experience. I'm like, what is, what is the missing piece? Like, why is this such an issue? And, um, there is this desire. I taught when I interviewed Charles Eisenstein about this, it was one of the biggest things we discussed as well as was this idea of, coming together in community and I'm wondering like what what is the disconnect you know or are we just in this grand reshuffling where everybody is trying to like finally realize like oh I do need to be part of a community I do need to put in conscious effort um what is your view on this as someone who's worked with community for your entire career <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think um 
Ooh, that's a big question. Yeah. It's so interesting. You know, I am moving from New Haven, Connecticut to Portland, Oregon. Literally, I'm flying today, later this evening. And um, we had a, a sort of farewell gathering um, at one of my favorite restaurants in my neighborhood this past uh, last weekend. And because of the pandemic, I haven't like gathered like with like that many people um, in one place that that I like like my people for two years, and so. There's something, it's like maybe I saw like two or three at a time here and there, but really it was just not happening. And so there's something about that regularity of like contact, that's important, that the pandemic has made more challenging um, the past couple of years. And, but even today, I'm still, I can still feel it in my body, having been with my people for just a few hours. And so it's like its own sense of vit- it's like a vitamin. It's like vitamin C. It's like vitamin community. Like there's something that it does phys- like physically to the, our bodies and our brains and um, to be in contact in that way, but also to just like know that you belong. Belonging has a huge impact on our just, yeah, our mind and our mind health and our resilience. And so I also feel that um, there's something around being able to um, be understood, you know, so it's not just like, oh, these are, these are people who I know, but it's like they understand and they hold the same values as you, as you and um, but that doesn't come with like, oh, there's no challenging that happens. Um, so I feel like when I think about community, I think about beloved community in particular. I think about um, folks who are moving more and more toward liberation um, in, in their life actions. I think about um, being able to like call people in when they might be hurting um, or expressing behavior that is antithetical to the values of beloved community. So being able to like pull people in and have the nourishing and challenging conversations that need to be had. When I think about beloved community, I think about um, also like the celebrating, right, of individual um, and knowing that that skill or tools or um, prowess that that individual has also then feeds the, feeds back it's into that community. Um, and I think that there is um, a sense of also uh, in a beloved community, like in some way, like collectively surrendering to we don't know everything and like we're, and we don't know everything together. Like there's something about that. And I think <clears throat> the, the role of like, a, you know, I want to be sensitive about this, but the role of the church in our in our society um, is really important. And I think that, especially as somebody who grew up in a Baptist church, though I rejected the ideology over time, but still, I still, in my body now, carry the love and the impact of like that deep sense of belonging. Um, and I think that, you know, churches are uh, going up for sale all over the place, you know, um, church goers, there's a huge decline. Like it's people don't have church. And so I feel like that the role of church is that sort of glue, um, that is, is missing now, I think collectively in our culture. So what replaces church? Um, you know, is it your medicine and integration circles? Is it your friend circles? Like, what is it? What is the place where you can say, I know there's something greater going on that I don't have control of, and I'm going to be in reverence to that, and also I'm going to, this is a place where I grow and learn. Um, that, that is without, <clears throat> without the religious ideologies and doctrine. And I, I think that for me, um, church is now becoming more, when I use church in this way, like, like a, how I just described it, it is becoming more um individualized 
So I just think there's like smaller pieces of community and people actually belong in a community that's, but it's not like this large thing like church. It's not like you're part of something that has like a hundred people or 500 people. It might be like your church is like this one thing you do with three people. Um, that's like super intense and like pulls you into being humble, uh, lear learning, and then being able to like witness and hold other. I feel like that's community. And it's just it, because of the globalness of the world right now, what that can look like and be is just very different. Um, and I think for particular groups of people, how they grew up, because I feel like if you ask a millennial, what they think about community is going to be really different than what, like what you and I might think about community or like our, our parents. Right. So I, um, yeah, I think, I think the landscape of what community is, is just also changing. So yeah. Yeah. Really well said. I know um, a friend of mine a few months ago and I was like, you know, because I'm saying the same thing everyone else I know is saying like, oh, I, I want more community, even though I pretty much know everybody, I think, like I pretty much know everybody where I live. But he, he had a point. He said, well, look, um, I believe it's kind of this. It's a different idea of community these days like I actually do have this international community of people that I've only met online I mean one day I pray that we can all gather together in real life but it is interesting I'm like wait I do have a group of friends that I have been connected to for many years that I only see in you know these online communities so maybe it is just different ways of seeing it but I do agree that it is centered around something spiritual usually you know it's like the the whole reason I'm connected to the people I'm connected to is because of our shared um you know our shared beliefs and our our spiritual practice our prayer our medicine prayer um so but yeah this is it's just been interesting how many people are talking about this and I do know it's 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 in our nature. It's you know it's we're humans. We're pack animals. Absolutely. In the pandemic. It's the same thing. It's like the first time I saw my like a group of friends together back in. Um, I had a little gathering Memorial uh, Labor Day weekend. I mean, I started crying. I was like, wait, I haven't seen you guys in two years. We all live like an hour away from each other, you know, <laughs> like all at once. Yeah. And it was only like it was still only twenty something people, but still. Um, so Hanifa, one last question for you. So I love what you had originally said about um, li really listening to spirit and saying yes to everything. That's actually how I got here to same journey where I was like, I had no idea even what a business coach was. How would I have known? But I just kept saying yes. I'm curious, what is it that you're saying yes to this year in the next, you know, six to 12 months? And what can people look out for? Um, besides yes Ooh. to moving across the country. I know that. <laughs> Yeah, um, so interesting. Um, there's so many things I'm I'm definitely saying yes to, and I think just sort of one last reflection on the last question, Beth, is just like the the name Fireside um, was dreamed up, and it we went back and forth about a couple of different names for the project, and we wanted to think about what how do we want people to feel when they're interacting with us, whether it's on the support line or through one of our trainings or um, when we're speaking um, and engaging folks. And it's like, we want people to feel like they're around a fire. Um, you know, from the beginning of time, humanity, we've gathered around fire, like no matter what culture you come from, you know, we've gathered around fires to be in community, to celebrate life or the passing of life, um, for initiations, um, for consul, um, for communing with spirit, um, for, yeah, celebration and music. And so this feeling of being able to come around a fire and warm, warm up um, and cozy in and be with others. Um, and to know that you're connected and that you belong is this, this feeling and this notion behind Fireside Project. And so when I think about what am I saying yes to, um, it's just like making that for, in terms of Fireside, it's just like rowing, rowing the fire, um, creating more and more opportunities for people to come to the Fireside, um, whether that's through we're launching a public education training this year also um, called the Psychedelic Citizen. 
um, and we are, you know, doing more work around letting people know we exist. And so definitely saying yes to, uh, yeah, speaking more, but also like creating um, languaging and storytelling uh, around what we're up to and why. Um, when I think beyond Fireside, um, I think for me, there's a part of storytelling that's so important and so vital. Um, and it, this is an amazing tool for, uh, for building community and um, also just like it's very cathartic. So there's a storytelling project that I'm working on called Growing Wilder. Um, and it's a collection of stories from my life, uh, travel stories, medicine and, and psychedelic journey stories, as well as like dream time stories. Um, and their recording, so so it's not uh, written, it's a sort of audio experience, and so I'm saying yes to like, you know, doing finishing that project and uh, sort of hosting my first live event um, with, with it, um, yeah, um, and I, I'm also saying yes to, um, yeah, just really getting in, being in nature more, having lived in, you know, the New England for a long time, and also just like coming out of winter, just being inside. And um, this pandemic has really made me very sedimentary. So this move across the country and like just getting into a new environment, a new city and exploring the world and just connecting more with, uh, you know, the life, earth energy, it feels really big for me this year. Um, and um, and yeah, and, and just saying yes to... Uh, you know, yes to what it means to surrender, you know, being in a surrendering place and, and saying yes to allowing um, what needs to emerge, to emerge. You know, as I always say, like, you know, life is what happens when you're busy making plans. And so just, I, I think just like finding that sweet spot of like allowing what's wanting to emerge in life to come through me and be with it, as well as like, you know, having some sort of logic uh, to be able to be effectively make you <laughs> make use of 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 the wisdom coming through. So yeah, that's a sweet question. Thank you. Beautiful. Yes, I love it. I love it. Allowing, emerging. These are key words. I I actually talk about this all the time. It's like it's very simple. Of course, we like to overcomplicate things, but surrender, emerge, Ooh, allow, sure say yes with just you know a little bit of logic to make it happen. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anifa, it was such an honor to have you here. I'm so glad people got to hear all about Fireside and everything you are up to. I'm so excited for you to move across the country. Be sure to come back and visit us mm -hmm. when the weather's nice on the East Coast. It, yes. We'll have yes. all the links. Uh, let's, huh? That's key. Yes. Yeah. I said that's when key the when the weather is nice. nice. Yeah, <laughs> late spring. Yeah, and so you'll have all the Yeah, we will have all the links okay. and provide all this information. I'm sure a lot of people will be interested, hopefully, yeah. in, um, you know, joining in the volunteer, because I do agree this is only going to grow exponentially as the world changes and there's more and more interest and people are really um, looking for healing and, and growth and, and hope for everything, for the collective liberation. So, Hanifa, thank you so much for being with us. It was an honor to have you. Thank you, Beth. Really appreciate it being here. Awesome. So great.